I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where I speak with creative entrepreneurs, artists, and other insanely interesting people to hear their stories, learn about their molding moments, tipping points, and spectacular takeoffs. Hugh Howey has on the surface what might appear to be a Cinderella story from the world of self-publishing. His best-selling series, Wool, caught the attention of acclaimed director Ridley Scott and has been turned into a screenplay. But as you might expect, there's a lot more to this story. Listen in as Hugh talks to me all about the small journeys that lead us to our destinations. Hey there, it's Srini. I hope you're having an awesome morning. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share a quick story with you. In my earliest days of being a freelancer, I had no processes and no systems, and I basically operated in a reactive mode. And this hindered my progress for many years, and I didn't even realize it. I was overwhelmed with paperwork, chasing down clients to get paid, and other time-consuming administrative activities, which weren't really all that valuable. Some simple math turned out to be one of the most revealing insights ever. I actually had the CEO of FreshBooks on the podcast, and he asked me, is your time worth more than $20 an hour? And when I said yes, he said, well, then you should be using fresh books and I have ever since and now you can even try it free for just two months and stop wasting your time dealing with invoices paperwork and all the other headaches that keep you from getting paid faster visit getfreshbooks.com and enter unmistakable creative in the how did you hear about us section Hugh welcome to the unmistakable creative thanks sir taking uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us thanks for having me man yeah my pleasure so You know, I have heard your name mentioned to me for years. I've I've come across you through a number of friends of mine. We've had multiple requests from you from some of our our own listeners and big fans. So tell us a a bit about yourself, your background, and and your story, and how that has led to the work that you do today. Uh, I guess the best way to describe myself is I I guess I'm something of a dilettante. I haven't really stuck with any one thing in my whole life. Um, I've bounced from job to job and adventure to adventure or whatever um, seems exciting and new. I, I've dreamed of writing a book since I was very young and it's something I tried several times and gave up on and thought I would never do. Mm-hmm. And um, after working uh, in the boating industry for quite a few years, I uh, got um, pulled inland by um, my wife and finally had the time to sit down and work on a novel and after realizing I could do it after completing that manuscript, I, I got hooked and I was writing two or three novels a year. Mm-hmm. And then a short story I wrote called Wool took off. I was working at a bookstore at the time and, and writing in all my spare time. And, and this story took off. And next thing I know, I'm quitting my day job and writing full time. And the the book just went nuts and got picked up uh, all around the world and for a film deal with Ridley Scott and um, yeah, it's just been the last two years. It's just uh, been a pretty wild ride. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're you're really kind of a poster child for for one of these stories. But I, I you know, before we get into all of that, I want to go back to the very beginning of this. I mean, you mentioned sort of this dilettante uh, period of your life, and I'd love to dig deeper into that because. It, one of the things that I always find when I talk to people is how much those periods of their life, which seem almost inconsequential, impact what is happening going forward. And I'd love for you to talk about that in more detail uh, because, you know, I, I think that that's something that I personally relate to, this sort of jumping from job to job thing before finding a calling. And, and I'm wondering how that, you know, influenced all how, you know, the work that you do today and kind of your worldview and your perspective on things. I, I, it's everything. I There's no way I would. Be able, I wouldn't have really anything, anything interesting to write about or, um, you know, I, when you look at the people who become writers, very few of them go the um, straight from university to an MFA program uh, and then produce their writing. It's uh, usually they come from their, uh, an odd profession. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, have some life experience that they're writing about. And uh, I guess that's the case with me as well. I, I majored in English when I was in college, but uh, I certainly didn't learn to write there. I learned to write from sailing around the Caribbean and visiting a lot of different countries and um, uh, having a lot of different unique life experiences Mm -hmm. Um, and reading a lot of nonfiction. Uh, Yeah, I don't don't know. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry. We have to do some editing. I just had a delivery guy come to the door. Okay. 
I got to run up there and, and sign something. Hold on a second. Okay, no problem. I'm going to go back and edit. Okay, that was horrible timing. <laughs> no problem. Do you want to start the question from the beginning and I'll go back and edit? Sure. Okay. Do you remember the question? Yeah, you're asking uh, about my yeah, earlier yeah. adventures. So just start it from there and I'll go back and slice this all out. That'll just make for a clean edit. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I don't think I would be writing today if it wasn't for all the travels and the things that I'd done. You know, the, the difficult thing about writing is you, you have to pull from something that you know. And uh, the more you experience and the more adventures you have, the the wider variety of stories you're able to write and the more characters you meet. You know, I've traveled all over the uh, Caribbean and down in Central and South America and spent time in places that are hard to get into otherwise, like Cuba and um, little islands owned by Colombia, South America, and um, spending a lot of time around um, different cultures and, and just being naturally curious. I think that has certainly helped my writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, when you look at the people who become professional writers, very few of them follow a, a direct path through university and MFA program and, and study writing and then become a writer. That's it's a great way to learn to edit and to learn <laughs> to write grammatically correct sentences. But you know, the people who, if you look at uh, John Grisham or people like that, they come from a profession where they know something about what they're going to write about. Mm -hmm. And and in my case, um, you know, the the stories that I wrote when I started my career with these adventure stories that really were modeled after uh, the sailing that I'd done. And, and I don't recommend to anybody having near-death experiences and going through <laughs> hurricanes and doing some of the really stupid things that I did. But um, I, I do recommend if you want to be a writer to say yes to any adventure that comes up. Um, like a quick example, when I was working at a bookstore in, in a university setting, you know, my spring breaks were spent um, doing these alternate spring breaks and taking, you know, I could have taken a week paid vacation, but instead I um, took a, a week of unpaid work to take kids to the Bronx and um, work in soup kitchens and live in a monastery in the Bronx. And, you know, I... Um, I pull from experiences like that. And I, I think if you want to be a writer, any, any time that you see some adventure pop up and you could say yes or no, just always say yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I think there, there's this pure gold there. Um, I, I do want to talk about this in a bit more depth, but I want to ask you something, you know, you mentioned the sort of notion of a dilettante. And I think that for every writer or every person who is a, a creative of any sort, there's almost this sense that they're a misfit or sort of displaced, uh, from fitting in into into society the way that it works, uh, and I'm really curious to kind of hear your thoughts uh, around that. And, and of course, I think there's also a sense that maybe there was something special about us that we lost in our childhood. You know, you mentioned also, uh, you know, wanting to write a book ever since you were a child, and, and then stopping multiple times along the way. And I'm curious, you know, one why you stop, and then two, um, how we tap back into that sort of. Uh, enthusiasm that we had when we were kids for these crazy, wild-eyed, impractical dreams? It's a great question. It's a great couple of questions. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of my skipping around and trying a lot of things comes from, uh, A, my uh, loss of faith. It's interesting that about the same age that I dreamed of writing a novel is about the same age that I um, lost my belief in, in God. And it was, I was very young. I was raised in a, in a Christian um, uh, home and uh, you know every year we went to a camp meeting where we spent. And I still go to the to this camp meeting every year that I'm in town. Uh, I've only missed a few in 38 years, but it's you know uh, 10 days of going to church twice a day and uh, you know very religious household. But by the time I was 12, I had um, lost all that belief and I was really consumed. You know I have all this poetry. It's horrible poetry that I wrote back then. Uh, just consumed with the idea of death, and I would lay in bed at night, terrified that I would close my eyes and um, and not open them again. And uh, you know, I, I I got over that, but for for a while there, um, and I think the way that shaped me is that I feel like I, I want to live as much as possible, 
um, in this life that I have here. Mm-hmm. And I, as long as it doesn't impinge on other people's, you know, ability to live their lives, it's not like a, a single minded pursuit of like, get out of my way. I'm having a good time here. Part of that as well as to try to make my immediate environment as pleasant as possible, you know, be nice to strangers and um, hold doors for people and do whatever little impact you can to improve your day to day, because that's, that's all I believe we have. I could be wrong about that. I mean, everyone has a different idea mm-hmm. on, on what life holds for us, but that, that feeling that we only have one chance at this, um, has made me very impatient about, uh, you know, like my, my greatest fear. And, and I, I say this, even though I admire people who have done this, my greatest fear is that I would like work one career for 50 years and retire and, not know what to do with my time, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that would be my whole life experiences. It would be one routine. So it would feel like I lived one day over and over again. Yeah. Um, I groundhog day to me is one of the most <laughs> deeply satisfying philosophical. I, I don't even see it as a, as a comedy, even though there are funny parts to it. I think it's, I think it's just one of the more um, uh, thoughtful films out there mm-hmm. about how, um, how horrible that life would be. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, uh, it seems I can go about five or six years in any career before I'm looking at some other challenge. And it also means that I don't master anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I, uh, I studied chess and started playing tournaments until I, um, found myself on the second table at a, at a major tournament set beside these two Russians playing at table one, watching me to see if I was going to win to decide whether or not to take a draw between the two of them. I was never going to play until I was at table number one, but I, I played to chess competitively until I sat at table number two. And then I thought after that tournament, I was like, that's it. I'm done. I, I, I don't want to expend that 90% of energy to increase that final 10% mm-hmm. of ability. And, um, I, I admire people who can spend their entire lives mastering something perfectly. And that's just, uh, never been me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I really appreciate that you know you're bringing up this idea of, of one career for the rest of your life because I think we're, we've kind of reached an era where that's just not even viable anymore, right? I mean, we're seeing it in the economy, we're seeing technology disrupt things like never before. Uh, you know, when you see something like Amazon's drone delivery, if you're a UPS driver, you probably should be considering the possibility that there's not going to be much of a future in this. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's just one of those things that you think about and. Uh, and the other thing, I mean, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of retirement because that does, I mean, it seems like such a boring existence. And I remember thinking back to something, it jogged my memory when you said that to something Zig Ziglar said, he said, you know, we, we somehow bought into this idea of retirement. And he said, but the, the reality is that some phenomenal things can be accomplished in older age if you allow them to be. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's, it's funny because that almost brings that idea of, you know, writers getting to where they're at through a very somewhat, you know, strange path, uh, full circle. Because I, I look at, you know, what I've accomplished in my 30s in comparison to the 20s, and it's it's night and day. Yeah, I you know, it's funny. I When I was 23, I, I took a leave of absence from university, and I was living on a little sailboat, and I just took off for the Bahamas. And and I, by the time I was 25, I was, um, I was a yacht captain, and I was driving um, $100 million yachts for the rich and famous. And... And I thought, you know, uh, people, I guess, in that industry looked at, at the course that I was on and they were, they thought that, you know, I'd be driving cruise ships by the time I was in my 40s mm-hmm. um, because that's the kind of trajectory I was on. But I, I knew even then that this was – I was having a lot of fun, but you you do anything long enough and it becomes routine and that terrifies me. So uh, even then I knew that I was going to do this uh, – for as long as it felt enjoyable. And then as soon as some other opportunity came up, I would do that. And I, I do agree that you have to be flexible with your careers because of how many, I mean, you look at how many people use TurboTax versus a CPA these days and mm-hmm. how many people um, t- t- book their own flights and hotels instead of using a travel agent. There's so many ways that programmer one programmer can provide a tool that allows everyone to kind of use the self-checkout line. Yeah. And, uh, but it, a lot of people you a lot of people stay in careers that, that are are somewhat related. Maybe that'll become less and less of an option. And I think it's terrifying 
but it's, it can also be a very, it could be a good thing for us. I think people can live fuller lives, even though the transition is certainly painful. Mm-hmm. Um, the unemployment rate, you know, despite the recession stays about the same, even with this mass uh, upheaval and, and the economy and different types of jobs. We, those people lose their jobs and tend to find new ones. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's not fun. I've been through it several times. And, and just because I seek out new things doesn't mean that it's easy. Uh, yeah. it's, it's terrifying and painful, but that's part of why I do it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I love that you brought up that's part of why you do it. Um, I had a guy here who you guys will have heard from by now who, who you know, was, had this amazing story on Wired about how he hacked uh, OkCupid okay using math. Uh, he was a math PhD student to, to end up meeting the love of his life. But one of the things he talked about was intentional discomfort um, and how putting yourself intentionally in uncomfortable situations is, a hu- is an amazing catalyst for growth. I totally believe that. Yeah, I, especially for a writer. I think that's just so important. Yeah. Um, you, you, you have to you have to embrace all the things that you that you fear the most. You know, you, you really um, I, I have so many fears, fears of um, tight spaces and heights. And, you know, my response to that is to jump out of airplanes and to live on little sailboats and to <laughs> be a commercial scuba diver in a in a city where there's like, you know, a foot of visibility and things that are just uh, make it difficult to go to sleep at night, mm-hmm. but um, also make you feel alive at the same time. And yeah, it's a, it's a challenging thing to do, but you know, I, I highly recommend it. You know, I, I want to get into this in a lot more depth, uh, but I want to go back to something that you said earlier. You mentioned this idea of losing your faith, and the question I have uh, around loss of faith is. You know, when we when we go through challenging experiences in our lives, and and when the circumstances of our lives uh, seem like they're not temporary and that they're they're never ending, uh, and we start to lose our faith, how do we how do we keep that from happening? I mean, is there a way, or is I mean, is losing the faith the key to getting it back? I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, you know, for me, um, faith was an an epistemological system that was kind of foisted on me. And I, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I consider my parents two of my best friends and they, they did what their parents did. And it's a, it's a cycle. But when I look back on it, it almost seems uh, abusive to take a kid before they're old enough to think for themselves mm-hmm. and teach them some of the things that I was taught, you know, and teach me to have that kind of a fear um, for reprisal and for punishment being meted out. And that I had to talk to someone every night and ask for forgiveness and all these things that that uh, whether or not they're um, whether or not they should be part of our lives, I think the time to teach them was probably about the time that I was um, dismissing them. You know, I think when someone's old enough, you know, we're, we teach them we teach them things that are to us so crucial, and that's our faith before we even have a talk about sex or drugs or curfew or any of that stuff you know we really start that process so young and i don't know that we're ready for it Mm -hmm. so for me losing my faith wasn't really necessarily a bad thing um i see it as the start of me sorting out the world for myself and you know i had to replace that uh that epistemological um system of, of knowing the world around me with something else and i chose the scientific method which was to just doubt things and be a cynic Mm -hmm. and be skeptical and and question and so i I had to start doing a lot of you know it takes a lot of extra work to do that than just to be told what the answers are and just believe them and um and so it it certainly wasn't the easy path but it was more rewarding when i i felt i found beauty in the cosmos that i I never found in um uh being you know told creation stories Mm mm-hmm yeah, I, I love the I love the idea of this w- willingness to to question what you've been told and to ask questions because you're right. I mean, I think that we are, at, especially as children. Uh, I mean, even even as adults, we're we're sort of force fed ideologies and uh, propaganda that life is supposed to be a certain way. And I think that when you start to to question all of that, uh, things start to unravel in somewhat of a fascinating way. And when they start to unravel, it's, it's a bit, it can be a bit overwhelming. But I think what's really amazing is when you get to the other side of that, uh, one of my friends describes it, he's like, it's like you've just been handed the red pill and you can finally see the matrix. Yeah, no, it is. And by seeing the matrix, you can see how confusing the matrix is. And yeah. that, 
<laughs> you know, maybe you can get a little glimpse here, and that makes a glimpse of you know so exciting. Also, something something cool about the scientific method in that you really you get really excited to be wrong, mm-hmm. uh, and that's to me the biggest difference between uh, faith and reason. Um, when you adopt a system of reason, anytime you get uh, proven wrong or you discover that some previously held belief was incorrect, you get excited because you realize that, well, that's an upgrade. The only way uh, you can go from being wrong to right is to have your, your belief systems, your, your, your understanding of the world somehow improve. Mm-hmm. And when you are um, raised with a system of faith, any, anything that says that you're wrong is a challenge and it instills fear and anger. And so uh, we get through our lives just being wrong about most things mm-hmm. and having a system where every time you're wrong, you see this as an opportunity for growth versus a system where every time you're, you feel like you're wrong, this is a challenge and a, an attack on who you are as a person. That's a, that's a very freeing um, uh, place to arrive at. I don't, it's not something I, I want to force on other people or, or tell other people they're wrong for whatever they choose. But from, for myself, when I'm, made that transition and it was a gradual transition. It happened over years. I could um, maybe say that it's even happening now. Um, uh, to me, it was a much happier life that I uh, discover on the other side. Mm, I love that. That's uh, just poetic. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, you know, one of the things that you've brought up multiple times is sailing. And I'm these influences are always interesting to me, especially as a surfer. Uh, the ocean has had this sort of profound impact on my creative capacity. It, it's sort of the driving force and the fuel behind the fire. So I'm really curious, kind of, uh, of all things, how sailing has influenced you as a creative person, like what kinds of perspectives it's brought into the way you see the world and and the work that you do. And then I want to start specifically speaking about the craft of writing. Yeah, for me, it's, sailing has been the most uh, profound experience in my life. Um, and it started very young. It started, uh, when I was maybe 10 years old, the beach house we went to every year, we spent two weeks there and we had this little sunfish, uh, sailboat that, um, was really a challenge for me to even get down to the sound behind the beach house and, and rig up, you know, stepping the mast was, a, was quite an effort. Um, this is the kind of boat that you are, you and I are at our age could grab the mast with one hand and just stick it in the the deck of the boat. And for me, I felt like I was one of those soldiers, uh, in Iwo Jima, um, you know, raising that flag, it felt heroic to get that mast in. So the, uh, the challenge of sailing that boat, but then the the freedom of being out on the water and being able to go where I wanted to and, and not have, um, any kind of supervision and being really feeling at, at one with the water and the wind and, uh, nature and, and it being quiet, uh, I, I really found myself as a, a young kid out there. And then every time I would get back on the water, I'd rediscover myself. And this still happens. You know, I, I, I now live in a house, but my wife and I go on uh, vacations and we'll charter a boat. And that's, you know, when she sees like every care in, in me just melt away. And, and that's when I feel like I'm in my, in my element. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know what that, I don't know what that did for me with my writing. Um, it, one thing sailing does and living on a boat did is it taught me the the value of patience and of slowing down. <laughs> and you, you don't get, you don't get where you're going in a day Yeah. Um, to get from, you know, I, I did trips um, uh, while well, I was, I was gone for a year one time just sailing around and I would have a destination in mind. And it might take me months to get there. And every day was a small journey and dropping anchor and resting and, and contemplating. And um, writing is a lot like that. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think a sailing journey has a lot in common with getting through a novel. Um, so, yeah, who I who I became as a person, really, uh, most, of, most of that transformation happened at sea. Mm. You know, yeah, I, I'm really glad I asked you that question because as a surfer, I can I can really appreciate that perspective, especially the patience piece, right? Uh, you know, one of the people asked was like, "Why can't surfers have normal jobs?" I'm like, "Because you're not on your own schedule. You're right. you're kind of at the mercy of what the ocean decides to do that day, and some days there are no waves, and you're just waiting for an hour to, to for that perfect wave to show up. But you know, it, it's that one way. You're there sometimes." 
10 seconds creates so much joy that the four hours you spent was worth it. Yeah. I've always, I've always appreciated that about surfing. I've never lived in a place where I had decent surf. It's, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the East coast has uh, <laughs> few, fewer options, but I, I do remember, um, as a kid uh, taking the, the longboard at that same beach house out and I would sit forever waiting for one little swell that would actually get me up. But yeah, it's, it, it's a very, uh, there's something serene about sitting there and watching and you, you really get to sense the pulse of the sea and you see how they come in in sets and you kind of feel that there's something happening far away that's influencing this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, I, I think being outside hiking, anything that you can do where you're in nature mm-hmm. and it's quiet and you're unplugged is, um, is a boon to, uh, uh not just uh, as creatives, but I think for all people, it's becoming more and more important to find that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the world we live in today. You know, it's funny. We had Stephen Kotler who, who wrote a book called the rise of Superman talking to us about the neuroscience of flow. And he said that what we find is, is activities like this while seeming, you know, like you're wasting time, it turns out across the board, when you can put yourself in states of flow, we find significant increases in human performance, which, you know, it's interesting to hear the scientific breakdown. It's no surprise to me having been somebody who, who finally found it. Um, but I love that you mentioned that you, you sort of found yourself at sea. Let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, Let's shift gears a little bit and and let's start talking specifically uh, about the craft of writing and your creative process and and how you approach all of this. Uh, And I guess where I really want to start with that is, you know, taking in all the sensory input of your life experience and then translating it to the blank page. I mean, what does that look like for somebody like you? You know, before I can write a story, I I have to have some theme or something, some observation about life, something that I want to comment on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not quite like satire, but I would, that's the closest thing I can really, uh, because satire I think has elements of humor, uh, implied. Um, but, uh, I, when I'm writing a book like wool, you know, I'm thinking about totalitarian states and I'm reading a lot of nonfiction, a lot of, um, uh, current events and, um, it's that writing is a way for me to consolidate my thoughts. It's almost like journaling Mm -hmm. where you don't really know what you think about a subject until you're forced to describe it to yourself. And uh, writing is a way for me to do that. I, I, I think the reason I failed at uh, writing when I was younger is because I was just trying to write a story about events. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had characters that were doing things and they might have one, major thing that they wanted to accomplish and then all the other little things they had to do on the way. And you can, you can put a story together like that, but I would, I can't stay interested enough in a story uh, as long as it takes to write it when that's my uh, entire goal. For me, it has to be a lot more than that. And, um, and so that's, that's my challenge with each story is, um, you know, what do I want to say, um, about what I'm learning or what I'm observing with, with, with each story. Uh, for for sand, it was my latest book. It was the opposite of wool. I'm, I was instead of looking at totalitarian states, I wanted to write about what it's like to live in, in a lawless condition, and, and in a way, it was a complete departure from uh, from wool. But um, I, you know, they they complement each other because of that. For me, hey everybody, it's Srini. As you know, the unmistakable creative is advertiser supported. And we're asking for your help by completing this short anonymous survey. It'll take no more than five minutes. Your answers will help us match our show with the advertisers that best fit the sensibilities of our podcast and its listeners like you. Listeners who complete the survey will be entered into an ongoing monthly raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card. We promise not to share or sell your email address, and we won't send you an email unless you win. So if you go to podsurvey.com slash story, that's www.podsurvey.com slash story to take our survey. You'll be entered uh, for a chance to win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, and we really appreciate your support. You know, I, I think it's uh, it's really interesting that you're a fiction writer, but nonfiction is like one of your big influences. That's uh, that's somewhat unusual. But I want to ask you uh, a question uh, based on something that I heard our friend Justine Musk tell me at uh, or to tell our participants at the Instigator Experience when people were asking her about the creative process. She said, you know, if you think about it this way, reading is the inhale, but writing is the exhale. And I thought about that a lot, and I thought, yeah, that's pretty brilliant. I said, but my thought immediately after that was, I'm like, I want to ask somebody if reading is the inhale and writing is the exhale, 
how do you keep writing from becoming the echo instead of the exhale? Does that well, make sense? No, that's a great, that's a, it's a good point. It, uh, yeah. How do you, um, I, I don't know that it's good to, to, uh, be sustained off the breath of another to mm-hmm. continue that analogy. I think at some point you have to, um, you have to go find something uh, new and unique to take in. And when I, I enjoy reading in the genres in which I write, but I, I avoid them while I'm writing in them. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up reading a lot of science fiction, but I, I read very little of it today because I don't want to encounter anything that I um, might go explore on my own because it, it just closes me off from that. Yeah. Um, you know, people think that uh, writers would have a temptation to copy, but in my experience, reading anything similar to what you might explore just closes you off from it. Now, now that you've seen that idea touched upon, um, you're terrified of going anywhere near it. <laughs> so, so it really, cl- it really limits you yeah. to to know what's been going, know, to know what's going on in your in your genre. I've also had the uh, a lot of feedback from readers that um, several of my books are in in genres where I kind of break all the rules and do something completely different. And I think that's been part of the uh, the reason for the the word of mouth success that I've had. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Mm-hmm. So people say, oh my gosh, this is, you know, it reminds me why I love reading. This is something I haven't encountered before. And I think that's because I'm not regurgitating um, what's, you know, current in the field. Um, I, I'm kind of writing what I wish was already out there instead of uh, trying to model my writing uh, after someone else. But I do love the analogy because I think in order to, in order to write, you have to, you have to constantly read. I think yeah. it builds your vocabulary. Um, it, um, it's like listening to a tuning fork. You know, you, you you develop a certain pitch or tone with your writings where it, not just the grammar, but it just flows and sounds correct. And the best way to learn that is to just absorb as much quality writing as you can uh, in, in all genres. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I love it. I mean, I love that you brought up bringing it, you know, from genres that you don't read something that is in the genre that you're w- currently working on. I mean, even Robert Greene told me that when he said he was working on mastery, he made a point not to read things like outliers uh, because he had his own ideas on the subject. And, you know, I mean, even when I've written books around marketing I, or anything like that or self-published books, I try not to look within the field itself. My inspiration comes from sources that just are out there. You know, you go and look for something that is way different than what you'd expect. And that's usually where I find this cross-pollination leads to really interesting things. I mean, my friend Meg Warden talks about creative cross-training uh, and how powerful that can be as well. So I, I think it's it's a really, really... Uh, it's a wise observation that you have to be careful because that's that's exactly how you end up echoing everything you've heard is if you read a, a bunch of books that are in the same genre. And that's, I mean, that's a big part of the reason when I look for guests on this show, I'll go and choose somebody who's robbed 30 banks over somebody that, you know, is some famous social media marketer. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, and yeah, I guess it's the same thing. You know? Right. I if want to get a perspective. If there's, if there's a lot of noise out there, then um, make a different noise. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it's, uh, it, yes, it's hard to be heard over all the den, especially when you're making the same sound as everyone else. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about risk. I mean, one of the things you just said was that you break all the rules. I, I, and I love this. This is one of my favorite areas to explore with creative people is, is how you take creative risks that uh, – that don't blow up in your face, but move you forward or cause you to grow, even if they're disasters. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, you know, I um, there's been several books that I've tackled that I thought, well, this will definitely um, end my career. You know, this is like <laughs> this is this is the absolute wrong thing to do. And I think I I think I did that on purpose. I think I sought those things out. And I don't know, it's not um, to be uh, destructive. I think it's, it was to be creative Mm -hmm. and the things that felt like, uh, okay, this is a non-obvious follow-up or this is the the wrong book to write next, um, kept me interested. And, uh, I'm normally not a a big risk taker, you know, like, uh, I'm very conservative with my, um, my finances and I don't put my, um, self in harm's way, uh, needlessly. But when it comes to creativity, I think that, um, that's that's how I stay interested uh, mm-hmm. to to do whatever's orthogonal to um, uh, my current uh, direction. You know, as soon as I I take right turns, you know, I take or I take right angles basically uh, instead of just forging along on one path that seems linear. When I get done with something, I just want it to um, zig and zag and see what else is out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's. It's interesting, right? I think that if we are not taking risks with our creativity, we run the risk of uh, the the se- what I call the sequel syndrome, where yeah, you know, you've seen these movies in Hollywood where they get a hit with one. It's like, what? We're on Fast and the Furious ten? Really? Have we gotten that far with this series? Uh, and they don't really change very much because they think they've found a winning formula. And of course, as a result, the wa- the work just keeps getting watered down until it caters to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, there's a great book about that out now, but called uh, Blockbusters, I think it's called, mm-hmm. um, and it and it has to do with how that makes complete financial sense. Yeah. Um, if if what you're, uh, you know, it, it really helps me that I've never been motivated by money. I've always lived a very uh, impoverished lifestyle, even when I've had money. You know, I've I've enjoyed living on a small sailboat that I um, that costs less than most people's cars, uh, and I, even now I live in a the cheapest house in the cheapest neighborhood in town because I, I just prefer that. But, uh, what, the, what's, what's awesome about that is that you don't have to make decisions based on maintaining a lifestyle or maximizing your income. Mm-hmm. And I think you, I think what studios have to do is they have to make different decisions than, uh, individuals. And, uh, there's a lot of, of creativity that comes out of independent voices because of that. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, uh, you know, I think that it's, you know, in my mind, I mean, I'm really glad we're getting to hear your story because I think that it's very easy probably for somebody from the outside. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about this to kind of look at what you've had happen uh, and think that you won the Internet lottery. But the reality of it is many, many years of refining a craft. And I'd love for you to talk about kind of uh, the journey since, since you know, the success of your books and kind of what that has been like and, and what your thoughts are on, you know, creative independent voices and, and the role in the world today and, and what the opportunities are. Uh, well, I, I think there's never been more opportunity um, it's the, the challenge of course, is that there's opportunity for everyone. Mm-hmm. I, when I hear people disparage that it's, I, I don't know, it has that, that feeling of someone got in the treehouse and now they're pulling the ladder up behind them. Um, and I, I just can't understand that. I think the, the fact that there's more opportunity for more people is just a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we should, we should embrace the, um, the, the, I don't even want to call it a competition because I don't think we're, I don't think it's a competitive thing. It's just more of a, a communal thing. Um, and I wouldn't want to limit access to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what, I think what helps is to realize that uh, most of the people who um, get involved in any creative endeavor don't take it seriously enough to um, rise to the level of the people who uh, approach this as a, as a potential career. Mm-hmm. If you, there are plenty of people who just want to write one book to say they've written a book and they, if they want to publish that and, and see it alongside everyone else's on Amazon, I think that's great. Um, those books are not going to get much visibility. It's just, um, so difficult for, uh, for any book to, to climb up the rankings. And I don't think we have to worry about 99% of them, but for anyone who wants to put in the, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's, 10,000 hours and produce, you know, a dozen works over a career, they're going to get better and their works are going to get more visibility because there's more of them all with the same name on them. Mm -hmm. Um, And the chances of getting one 
one reader who likes your work and then goes and looks for what else, uh, what else you've written uh, improves. So I, I think um, looking at the amount of luck that I've had is not useful. I, I really don't like being a, a poster boy for anything. I don't think, yeah. I don't think we should use JK Rowling as a poster woman for, um, for traditional publishing. That's mm-hmm. uh, an unrealistic expectation to place on any creative person. I think it can stifle creativity to, to set your expectations that high. So I, I would tell people, um, you know, that where I was in November of 2011, when I was, you know, making one or $200 a month and I had eight works out and, um, I was, uh, writing in my spare time, but probably would never make a full-time living off of it. But, you know, in, in three years of writing, I'd sold 5,000 books, which I thought was phenomenal. And I was being invited to talk to creative writing classes and to go to middle schools to talk to classrooms because the the teacher there loved one of my books and got her kids to read it and so i had little things like that to hang my hat on and that was enough to sustain me and where where i was after three years of writing two or three books a year i think anybody can get to yeah. um but very few people that's why you, you don't really have to worry about a flood of competitors very few people are going to devote all of their free time single-mindedly to the pursuit of um mastering their craft Mm -hmm. and if that's where you if that's where you are someone listening to this if that's where you are uh, as a a reader and an aspiring writer you're already in the top fraction of one percent of people who will actually put that amount of effort and energy into this Um, and uh, you know that's that's heartening you know it's uh, I I like that it's this difficult because it makes it more rewarding when we accomplish it uh, individually and it also makes it more of a meritocracy when we look at the the people who um, do end up um, making a career out of it. It's usually because they put a lot of effort and energy into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I really appreciate uh, you, you kind of shedding light on that because it, it's true. It, it's really easy. I remember looking from the outside in, right? When you, when you, when you're actually, when your feet are finally to the fire, you get, or you get a dose of the reality of how difficult uh, it really is and how much work it is because we don't hear about, like, we don't know you until all of a sudden you're this overnight sensation, supposedly, right? Like, nobody's heard the name Hugh Howie, and then suddenly we do. We know who you are. And it's really easy to overlook that three years. And I always say, I mean, how long can you go without any sort of external reward for your effort? Uh, you know, as I told you before we hit record here. I think we've been running our show for four years and this is the year in which things have really taken a turn. And yeah. even then it, what got us here is what we have to keep doing. That's a great point. I mean, I, that's something that I tell, um, when I talk to creative writing classes, mm-hmm. I ask them like, how long can you write without an audience? Because that's what, that's what musicians have to do. It's what comedians have to do. They have to spend a lot of time creating without any sort of reward or any, uh, applause or any monetary uh, benefit, you have to do it because you enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And if if you don't have that in you, and you don't know until you try, but yeah. if you don't have that in you, it's it's almost impossible to to make it. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this: uh, you know, one one of the other other conversations. I mean, you talked about sort of the one percent of one percent that that have that drive. I want to talk about talent um, and the role that it plays because. You know, Julian Smith, uh, who is somebody we had back here, he said, you know, the web is a ruthless battle for attention, which means that what you create has to be that much more epic than another person's. And, of course, that's that's somewhat subjective, but I think there's still some validity to that. Um, I think that crappy stuff just doesn't see the light of day. That's that's you know that's what I'm finding more and more, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as somebody who has now kind of you've gone through the three years, you you really sat down and, and committed to something. I totally agree with that. Um, I uh, crappy stuff will disappear. the The other thing that will baffle people is that what you think is crap mm-hmm. might not be what most people think is crap, yeah. and um, that can be really confusing when you see something that you just think is obnoxious and everyone is jumping all over it. Uh, you know, we have to accept that as individuals that we that we are not the universal arbiters of taste, and um, it, there's a there's a collective uh, correctness, and and that's the, the best way to put it. Like whatever the whatever the, the the crowd thinks is worthy, is it's it's a tautology. That's 
that's how worth is defined by uh, a subjective uh, partaker. So, um, you know, I think when people uh, uh, working in a bookstore, I used to have to defend books like uh, Twilight, and Fifty Shades of Grey and Dan Brown and say, look, these books are bringing enjoyment to a lot of people. They're doing something correct. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you're, you're better off learning from them than uh, disparaging them. And I, I think it's too easy for us to act snooty when our, when our tastes aren't reflected in the, the tastes of the populace. Um, for those books, uh, you know, what I learned from them is that um, if people can have a choice between plot and prose, they're going to choose plot every time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, it's, it's a handful of people who appreciate prose more than plot, and those are the people who are baffled by um, the, the breakout successes that they can see uh, what are rule breaking, um, uh, maybe deficiencies. Um, but that's not why those people are buying those books. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's all kind. Of, I had so many friends who were professors who were writing just beautiful prose, but all the books were about their life. Cause the only life they'd ever had was going from grade school to high school, to university, to graduate school, to getting their, um, you know, their position at a university to getting tenure. And so they were all writing novels about a college professor going through a divorce or something. Mm-hmm. And, and they're writing beautiful prose, but they have nothing to write about. Sure. And, uh, and yeah, so I think when we, when we see what floats up to the top, I think we can't, we, we should understand why some things float to the top and not um, look at what we uh, wish was up there. I, I see a lot of that where we, we take our own tastes and we, um, uh, we we think that that should be universal, and it's a very egotistical um, position to have. I think. Yeah, that's a, actually you know I've never heard it put that way, but that's a, a really really fascinating way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean the other thing that I would say based on kind of what I've seen and observed. Uh, just based on on self-publishing. I mean, kind of like you, I had just freakish success of a self-published book that did really well and, you know, has led to a lot of other things. And yet, you know, there's a couple of things that come from it. One, I'm like, that's, I look at it and I was like, okay, I definitely could do, the next work may not have the same, you know, uh, fanfare, but it will definitely be better writing because now I feel like I have to hold myself to a higher standard. But the other thing, that uh, I think I, I'm finally observing as I watch things like the John Stewart show or I watch things like the Colbert Report and I watch the mainstream media, we, you know, yes, the internet has democratized everything, but they have resources, which means our only option is to step up our game and really, really produce high quality work. If we're going to compete with that, and the legion of people who have access and ability to create like they could never before. Yeah, and you know, when I see things that are that brilliant, I realize I'll never be able to match yeah. the, that sort of quality. But uh, I also realize I don't have to. Uh-huh. Um, as you know, someone can have uh, millions of followers or millions of diehard fans. Well, that leaves um, six point eight billion <laughs> people. For, for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are uh, fans of more than one thing. So the what's beautiful about the, this globalization is the, the long tail is reachable by anybody. Um, you only need, and, and this is a, a famous maxim, but watching it play out in my life uh, for real really taught me how powerful this is. I mean, you, when you hear this, it's easy to just dismiss it as a number or um, a saying, but it is it can transform your life. If you have 1000 diehard fans who want everything that you do, you you can do what you do professionally. You can do it full time. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it now there's two things about that number. That number seems really small. Uh, when you think about how big other people's fame is, you know, people have millions of Twitter followers and you can't have, you can have 20,000 Twitter followers and you might not have a single diehard fan. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that number of thousand seems very small until you go out and try to get people who aren't your friends and family or even your friends and family to um, pay money for your art or to even sit down and, and take the hours it might take to consume your art. And you realize the challenge that you have because, you know, your mom might be an easy get, but she's not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And if you disappoint her the first time, she might not 
you know, sit through your, your second uh, home film or your second album or your read your second book and getting a thousand strangers to, to love what you do more than they love anybody else in your field is that's a huge number. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you dedicate yourself, I think you can slowly build yourself up to those thousand fans. You just have to put in the hard work. You have to comport yourself professionally. You have to, um, I can't remember who said, was it Neil Gaiman who said like, don't be a dick. That's one of his roles. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's achievable. Um, it's just hard enough that not everyone's going to achieve it, which, which we should be thankful of, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so true. Uh, as somebody who's dad has never read any of his books i can totally relate so i'm like wait a minute i'm like thousands of strangers have read this book and you're on a 17 hour flight and you can't read it it takes an hour uh but no i I think that that's that's absolutely true so you talk to me uh, about you know you mentioned um right at the beginning of our chat that you've now you know you're starting to look into a film uh, with ridley scott i mean these, these are like sort of dream things i mean how has your life changed as a byproduct of this i mean talk to me about where this is all going and, and where things are headed for you now uh well uh, the film i don't it, to me the um the the apex of that whole process was um finding out that Ridley Scott, Steve Zalian read the book and enjoyed it. You know, everything <laughs> after that's been a bonus. Um, you know, the, the fact that they optioned it, they've, they've re-optioned it. So it's, um, it's paid handsomely twice and that's been great. But, um, I, I don't have any expectations that a film would get made. I think I, uh, I, I've used low expectations throughout my career to, to, um, keep myself constantly delighted with every, uh, you know, every little thing that happens to me, it all seems, mm-hmm. Uh, unexpected. So I don't, ex- I don't expect a film to get made. Um, uh, I was, uh, I was thrilled with every little bit of the process. They've written a screenplay that I think is absolutely brilliant. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's better than the book. <laughs> um, and so to me, you know, uh, who, who, I guess it's easy to, you can, you can look up and be disappointed all the time, or you can look back and just be gobsmacked that this is your life. And that's, I choose the latter. Yeah. And to realize that, man, someone's written a screenplay based off a story that I wrote, that just seems bizarre and, and magical to me. Mm-hmm. I, other authors, I think you could sit here and be um, upset that they haven't made a film. And when are they going to make it? And are they, are they ever going to make it? And you agonize about it. And that's that's just not how I um, like to go through life. So I, I usually disappoint readers when they say, like, when, when's a film coming? And I, I tell them, <laughs> never. It's never coming. Yeah. <laughs> and uh you know, I, if, if I'm, if I'm wrong, that'll be a day to celebrate. Mm-hmm. If I'm right, then I have the, um, the satisfaction of, uh, being prepared for that, I guess. You know, I, I think maybe the biggest takeaway for me from all of that is being delighted with every little thing, right? Uh, that's so, that's so counterintuitive and hard to do for people when you constantly look online or look at somebody else and see that they're up to something far more epic. You know, I was talking to a friend and she said, why are you so excited over people buying a $25 ticket to your local event when you guys just sold out a 60 person conference? You know, I said, I don't know. I mean, because it, it it's small. I mean, some, somebody just paid to be part of something I created with my own two hands. That's cool. How can you, you know, to me, I was like, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that somebody has that much faith in me. Uh, so I, I think that that to me is perhaps the biggest takeaway of everything you just said is, is that we have to appreciate those things. You know, uh, we had Chris Gillibo here and I remember asking him, I was like, you've got this massive audience. And he said, yeah, but it didn't start that way. And he said, if somebody's paying attention, treat them like the most important people in the world because they are. Absolutely. I, that's been my attitude toward, um, social media. I don't think social media is very useful for an artist to reach out and, beg for new people to pay attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a great way to, um, to kind of uh, whisper into the void about what you're doing yeah. and, and just be excited about the creative process and journal about it online. But when, when, when you direct what you're saying, you should be directing it to the people who already care because yeah. they're the ones who are going around advocating or, you know, using spreading your work by word of mouth. Um, people, when a friend or a family member uh, or a colleague tells someone you should check this out, that 
that you trust that a lot more than when the person who created it stands to gain, um, who wants your money. You know, when they ask you to check it out, it's like you dismiss that. Mm-hmm. So I would much rather, uh, a, I'm not comfortable doing that. I mean, I'm, uh, it's uh, off putting when I see other people do it and I, I don't feel comfortable um, going around saying like, Hey, my book is awesome. You should read this. Um, but B the, the more important thing is I would much rather spend my time interacting with people who care to interact with me. You yeah. know, people who are excited, I'm excited to interact with them. They're excited to interact with me. Um, uh, it's, it's a slower process. If you're, if your goal is to, um, have a lot of success, but it's a much more genuine and much more enjoyable one, unless a lot, uh, less stress involved. Mm-hmm. Um, when I had one reader, when it was my wife, all, you know, so what'd you think about that chapter? What'd you think about this? And, um, I, I can't believe you finished the book. And, you know, um, you know, my, my wife, um, got really mad when I killed a character in my first manuscript and we had this great debate and I rewrote the book to, to keep the character alive mm-hmm. and having someone who cared about something I was creating that much was, that was all that mattered to me. And then my mom, enjoyed the work. And my first cousin, Lisa, who became a huge advocate and was telling everyone, she was, you know, I sent her the manuscript and a word file. Mm-hmm. And she was like, can I share this with people? I'm like, absolutely. And she was sending it to everyone she knew. And they were all reading my book on their laptops and wanted to know when they could buy a print edition. Mm-hmm. And, and then when that came out, then all those people wanted to share that with other people. And so, you know, having the, getting that enthusiasm and interacting with the people who cared was to me much more powerful than trying to get people who don't care to care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as somebody who's, who's taken that tack pretty much the entire time I've built this up presence, I I completely agree. Uh, You we're getting close uh, to the end of our time together. So I I want to ask you one last question and this is how we close our interviews uh, at unmistakable creative you know, we've talked quite a bit about really standing out above the crowd, and our show is called The Unmistakable Creative. So uh, based on, on your own experiences as a writer and somebody who's, who's really seen your share of success with, with all this, um, what is it that makes something or somebody unmistakable to you? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I find I find as much I, I find there's something to love and to be fascinated about with every individual, um, but part of that, well, you know, I, that's something that I had before I I was really focused on being a writer. I I've always had this um, uh, this love of listening to other people tell their stories, you know, and if any time that I could spend with someone much older than me and hear what their life was like, or if I can. Um, I used to sit with um, homeless people and just uh, chat with them, you know, and, and find out uh, what their life is like today and what it was like before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I would, if, if they want money or a meal for me, then I want a story in return. And I wanted to know, you know, um, uh, what it's like to, to be there. And, and I've met people, uh, I met a homeless guy in Miami who was a who had a law degree, and had lost his family in a car accident. Uh, he wasn't involved in the accident; they were um, by themselves. I can't remember how many kids he had, one or two. But um, he uh, he started drinking and never wanted to work again. Like something broke inside of him uh, when he lost them. And and uh, you know, for all I know, he's since repaired that and he's now back practicing law. But meeting someone in that situation that um, that guy was, I mean, this was, I was, uh, 25 or 26 when I met this guy. Mm-hmm. So it's 13 years later, uh, that I'm still thinking about him. Uh, I, I think about him probably at least once a month. Wow. And, uh, you know, he, he, when I met him, he was trying to convince me to, um, share a bottle of liquor with him, uh, out of a brown bag. And, um, and refusing food because that's not what he wanted. You know, he just wanted money to, to stay as numb as possible. Is that, is that someone that I, uh, like respect or admire? Not, I, I don't think those words are quite the right words to use for that, but is it someone I found fascinating and like, I care deeply about? Absolutely. Um, and also the more you do that, the more you realize, uh, that, judging people is just uh, 
an exercise in futility. You just don't know what's going on in someone's life and how they got to where they are. And that doesn't mean that people aren't responsible for their actions. It doesn't mean that we forgive them for being abusive or, or doing harmful things to other people. But I, I, I think it means that um, we're not immune to being what, what exactly what they are. You know, we could easily be the people that are in, in their positions. If I've learned that anywhere, it's through fiction. That's the beautiful thing about reading fiction is that it puts you in the, the skin of, of someone that you're not, a profession that you're not, a gender that you're not, a race that you're not, in a time in which you don't live. And um, I, I, I think what you learn from that is what it would be like to be another person. And that makes it, it, it makes your pool of, uh, your, your us pool, your in-group pool, uh, more inclusive. And um, so, yeah, I, uh, it, it's hard for me not to be fascinated with everybody. You just have to dig uh, deep enough. I mean, uh, I think the biggest lesson in life is that the people around us aren't decoration in our little bubble. You know, our, our bubble is, is what we can sense around us, our, our perception. And people pass in and out of our bubble. And to us, they're sort of like um, props or decoration. And the, um, when the more you exercise empathy, the more you learn that we're just passing through their bubble and that every person you see, every car going by the, down the road by you, the person in that car has their own goals for that day and for their life and their own dreams and ambitions and their heartbreaks and all these things that make them who they are. And every bit of that is as deep as what we have in ourselves. And I think it, that's so obvious that when you say it, it's like, well, of course I know that. But operating with that um, idea in mind day to day takes practice because it's very easy to slip into my wife is my wife rather than the person who sees me as her husband. And she has her, you know, what, what does the world feel like to her? What does the world seem like to her? Um, that's, uh, to me, that's like the most important thing we can, we can do in life is to have that sort of awareness of other people. And as a writer and as a reader, it's, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, to me. Amazing. Uh, I think that was a, a perfect and beautiful and poetic end to our conversation. Hugh, uh, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share some of your insights with our listeners uh, at uh, Unmistakable Creative. I have a feeling you're going to be a big hit. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I appreciate the interview. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And for those of you guys listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Today's episode of The Unmistakable Creative has been brought to you by FreshBooks, the simple accounting solution for business owners who want to skip the headaches of tax time. No more hunting receipts, digging for invoices, or going through records one at a time. For a limited time, you can try it free for 60 days. That's two whole months to see how much more efficient it will make your invoicing process. Visit GetFreshBooks.com to learn more. And remember, when you get to the How Did You Hear About Us section, enter Unmistakable Creative. And don't forget, when you support our sponsors, you support our show. You've been listening to the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. Visit our website at unmistakablecreative.com and get access to over 400 interviews in our archives. 